Today, we're going to talk about New Suns Volume 2s, but specifically, I'm going to go through and approximately discuss something in media that each of these stories reminded me of, kind of like a, if you like this aspect, you'll find it in this story, vice versa, things like that. Just a reason for me to discuss the stories in this collection and other books and media that I love. Um, I did this in the past with the um, collection Exhalation by Ted Chiang, so I'll have that link down below if you like this type of idea. But at the end of the day, it's just me recommending a lot of stories and gushing about things. So hopefully you're here for that. Um, so we're going to start with the first story in this co collection. It's called Ocasta. Um, this one was really cool and ironically reminded me of a novella that is in the Exhalation collection. This is um, the Lifetime Cycles of Software Objects. Um, that's the approximate name. I'm really bad at titles of things once they get longer, but it's what I always call the Neopet story in um, Exhalation where you have these Digians and they go through life cycles. And this story, Ocasta, is about the evolution of this AI and this AI is in space telling its story and through it the story of the human race as it saw it. It is bittersweet. It is done in that really unique format that you can really only get away with in a short story, and it was one hell of a way to start the collection. So if, if you like kind of seeing the evolution of technology and its interaction with humanity, and you like unique frameworks, yeah, that story is pretty great. The next story in the collection is The Farmer's Wife and the Fairy Queen. This is like a very fun modern fairy tale thing. Like some things are tell, told in like very classic, once upon a time sort of sense. And other parts kind of slip into dialect and feel more modern. And so for that reason, I'm going to pick either The Changeling or Lone Woman by Victor Laval. He does a really good job at like dark, modern or modern adjacent fairy tale tellings, I feel like. And both of these are horror, technically, <laughs> but they also both have like those dark fairy tale aspects. And although I think The Farmer's Wife and the Fairy Queen is more whimsical than it is dark, it's uh, they're touching on similar themes, specifically Lone Woman about how women come together and support each other is a big theme in both of them. So yeah, I, I couldn't help but think about him when I was reading this story, even though tonally I don't think it's a one-to-one, -one, but if you like adult fairy tales, like fairy tales for adults, giving adults good messaging about what can happen when you come together, I recommend. I mean, I recommend everything, really. I mean, there are some stories in here I don't love, but for the most part, it was a hit. The next one is Juan by Darcy Little Badger, and it was really hard for me not to just recommend another Darcy Little Badger because it reminded me of her novel. So, I mean, that's good. There's a lot of consistency between her short work and her long work. Juan takes place during the pandemic, but it's not really about the pandemic other than it affects where Juan sleeps because he doesn't want to risk getting his mom sick because he works, I think, at like a Target <laughs> or something like that. But in the process gets wrapped up in this larger than life myth. So it's like kind of modern day magical realism thing. And because of that, I will recommend anything by Anna Maria McLemore, Blanca Iroha, Dark and Deepest Red. Those are two that I've read. And they both have this, it feels very contemporary, very grounded in reality, but also there are things that are not grounded in reality happening. And they're very like mythical, for folkloric, that type of thing. So that's my recommendation here. This next one was hard for me because so Neti Neti was probably one of the ones that stuck with me the least. It's like cyberpunk in India, but also has weird dream magic. And so because of the dream magic, because we do spend a lot of time in that space, what that space means, the costs of that space, I was starting to think about the Dream Blood duology by N.K. Jemisin. So if you haven't read that duology by Jemisin, it, the first book, The Killing Moon, was her first written, not first published. And it has this magic connected to the four humors. And part of it is you have these gatherers who can take dream blood. Um, it does result in the death of someone. And there is this kind of pseudo travel to a dreamlike plane. And it's one of my favorite versions of that. And both of how these dreamlike locations work in that short story and these two novels reminded me of each other. That's really about it but it's, it's the connection that I made. This next one might be my favorite story in this collection, and that is Equal Forces Opposed in Exquisite Tension by John Chu. This is about a boy who basically is getting ready for a university exams, and he's doing like two schools at the university, so he doesn't know which one he's going to commit to. He knows what his parents want. He's just really good at stuff, but he also at the same time meets a guy he has a crush on, <laughs> and it's, an, it's a great story. It's a great story about transitions, making decisions in life, and Basically, because I was so connected by the interpersonal stuff, and lately an author that's been really working for me in that regard, I'm putting um, a bejeweled on this now. So this is Shards of Honor. Thematically, we're really not in the same 
ballpark at all. <laughs> I'm connecting these two because the thing I love about both of them are character interactions, connections, working through family things, processing life changes. That's pretty big, especially in like Shards of Honor and Bariar. So that's that's what's getting the, if you like this, you might like that portion here. Otherwise, they are vastly different sci-fi worlds and thought experiments. <laughs> Up next are we have Nevo, Silk, and Cotton, which is about what people do after oppressors come in and how they survive, especially those who used to be servants of the noble class. Do they then transfer their services to this quote-unquote new noble caste? How does that make others feel about them? It's really interesting. And I'm reading the Dandelion Dynasty right now, which is also about changing governments and how the common people react to different turmoil, and I just couldn't help but think about one while reading the other. I mean, I do think I prefer the project of the Dandelion Dynasty more, but like that is literally giving itself 4,000 pages to ask and answer the question. This had like 20. <laughs> so I think for 20 pages, Nevo did a fantastic job if, like I was trying not to compare things to things that authors already wrote, but if you like Empress of Salt and Fortune, that's what this short story reminded me of. I've also read Siren Queen and other works. So this is more closely connected in my mind to how the political world building works in the Empress of Salt and Fortune, if you've read that. Next up, we have Tananari Du's short story, Supper Time. This is a very fun, like, horror-adjacent book. Like, it's definitely, like, unsettling, but I wouldn't say it's, like, horror-horror. There's more tension, I feel. Uh, regardless, this reminded me of a movie. It reminded me of the movie Nope. Um, and it's hard to talk about this genre without spoiling things. But essentially, there is even an emphasis on photography and capturing moments and witnessing. And that is a case in both Nope and this story, um, in the story Supper Time, we have this young girl who had raised a bobcat. And it's generally like, I think we're taking place in the early 20th century. And her family lives a little bit removed from town in a relatively nice house. They are still having to deal with racism. And so she's kind of in a place though, where she's young, but almost like on the verge of like adulthood responsibilities and trying to figure out where she fits into gender roles a little bit because she needs to like help her mom but she wants to do her own thing she loves photography and then this bobcat enters her life again and that is where the story kind of takes off it grew on me this story definitely grew on me this next one was actually really hard for me and it's called good night gracie and this one i'm actually going to compare to siren queen <laughs> by me nevo and so good night gracie is is interesting. It kind of has this multi-dimensional aspect where you have our main character who once got displaced from their world and has been traveling dimensions with these other two characters. And it's very ethereal, very dreamlike. There are monsters. Maybe our characters are monsters. It, it's hard to feel grounded in this story. And this story is about these relationships and what do they mean. And I felt very similar when I was reading Siren Queen. I like Siren Queen more. I felt like Siren Queen had more of a focus. But the reality versus that dreamlike place, the monsters among us in Hollywood, I felt like vibe wise, these were on a similar plane of existence, which is why I'm putting them next to each other. All right, up next is A Borrowing of Bones, which I really like. This is by Karen Lawachi, who is an author. I've read a couple of their short stories and I really liked them. And this one was no exception, although it is has some of the most unlikable character and character relationships you're ever going to read on page. But I think that's what I loved about it. It was oddly cathartic for me because I was experiencing someone going through anxiety spirals in a way that I go through them in relationships when communication is bad. And I'm so far removed from my bad mistakes that it was, it, it was interesting seeing a character go through it. And so because it is about prickliness, it's about people making bad but realistic decisions, it's it's really not great. It has a lot of ethical questions. And so for that reason, I'm comparing it to The Echo Wife by Sarah Gailey. I, because this also has a very prickly main character who's not making necessarily great decisions. There's a lot of ethical questions. And I do think the thing that would work or not work when picking up either of these is... How insufferable is the main character situation to you? Because that's the focus, that's what you're exploring, and that can be really grating in both scenarios, or really fascinating, depending on where you come to it from. All right, and this next one, really, it was kind of, it was a really rompy good time, and this is Chosen. <laughs> And it was, it felt odd to me because usually in short stories, there's more of a thematic message, or I feel like there, there's a lot densely put in, but this was just kind of a silly fun time. <laughs> And I don't think I was prepared for it. So I would probably just compare it to other space operas um, like Chilling Effect or Velocity Weapon, where there's definitely heaviness in it, but there's also a nice layer of quip on top of it. So if you like a quippy natured story, this one was pretty okay. 
And then following that, we have home is where the heart is. This is creepy. And I was trying to figure out which haunted house story to compare it to because it has those haunted house story vibes. And I think build your house around my body was the one that I liked the most. But truly any haunted house story that deals with generational trauma, this short story, this short story also plays with fairy tales like um, Little Red Riding Hood and a few others. The house is fairly sentient. So any of those types of haunted house horror books you can compare to this. It, it was just... It was just really interesting. It was totally odd because at times it was very whimsical, but also it was very disturbing because the first scene of the story is this person's heart is no longer in its their body. It's in the garden. <laughs> and she's like, what's going on? And she has to go into the house to find her grandmother and figure things out. And it's one of those houses where you have like those never ending hallways. So if that's like an aesthetic you enjoy. So it's appropriately creepy. So I, I enjoyed that because I am also just a sucker for haunted house stories. Those are just like my thing. All right, and so now we have Before the Glory of Their Majesties. I will say this is by far my least favorite project in New Suns Volume 2. My issues with it are with the execution, not the project. It's meant to show the reader that the author made a mistake in missing their own ableism, and it, like, breaks the fourth wall and talks to you in a sort of essay format while trying to do two versions of the same tale to fight back against the ableism they were putting in. And, you know, the vulnerability... I guess, great, it really didn't work for me from a story perspective or from a teaching perspective, which is why I would point you to this nonfiction, Disfigured, which is where I started my journey of learning about ableism in fantasy and fairy tales. So that's what I would, I would just aggressively be like, actually, I think this is just a better starting point <laughs> than this short story. But it was interesting. It was unique. It was vulnerable. All of those things. Um, but this next one, th there was like a stretch where there were some stories where I'm like, man, I don't know if I love all of these. This is the collection already done, which I mean, at this point, I'd read 70% of the collection, so it was doing great. But we have Haunted Bodies of the Womb Men, and uh, it's disturbing. It's a very disturbing graphic story about um, reparations and revenge and curses, and it's very graphic. So there are two dark sci-fi works I would point to for this, and that's Bone Shard Orchard or Destroyer of Light. Both of these discuss a lot of the themes in this. They're very heavy. They're very graphic. They look into things like loss of body autonomy and stuff like that. And that's really heavy for the story. Ironically, there's also a story by this author in Africa Risen that I read. And that one was equally like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you are processing things, author. This is so dark, sometimes really over my head. Um, interesting, compelling art. Um, like I would almost want to compare it to Goliath where it's like, this is really challenging, but I think there's really, really great payoff, but Goliath is not nearly as dark <laughs> as what this story is doing. So, and I think that's what I want to emphasize because this story is just like, whoa, just whoa. Up next, we have Dragons of Utah, which is kind of about, it's similar to like the Nevo story where, you know, what do you do when oppressors come in? And this one's, what do you do when the time to rebel is not now? We follow a main character who got exiled for a time, and then it was apparently time for them to come back. And when I was reading this, I was also reading Bone Shard War, and so I was being reminded of this, because this is kind of a whole discussion in the Drowning Empire series, which I do believe by the time you're seeing this video, I have my series review up for that series if you want to see it. But the idea of when is the right time to change governance and how do you do it? Um, and then there's just also some of the world building stuff that reminded me of each other. That'll be my kind of connecting point here. And I think I like them about the same in that they are good, but not like amazing versions of what they are. So that was another reason why my brain connected the two. The Plant in the Purest. This is the one story that I did DNF because I'm trying to DNF things when they don't work. And I DNF with like three pages left. So I probably should have just finished it, but it wasn't working for my brain because Malka Older does not always work for my brain. And this was a case where I was truly like, the way the sentences were being written was not giving me anything. But what I did understand reminded me of Horizon Zero Dawn. So I love Horizon Zero Dawn. And like, that was the thing while I was reading, it's like, man, I really want to be watching whatever is happening. This sounds really cool, but I cannot visualize it. I have no grasp of what's happening. But what I basically got is it's very like Indiana Jones, future way after something bad's happened on Earth. And we have people with new tech and relationship to Earth, which is, you know, loosely tied into the Horizon lore. <laughs> So aesthetically, I felt both of them. Um, and they're both kind of action packed situations. It's just the action of this story and the why are we doing it wasn't working for me. It is interesting because the title plant and the purist in this time, people can have implants that can um, 
increase their senses in different ways. And so we have one person who has more plants than most people, more implants than is normal, and then someone who chose to have zero. And they are kind of sort of paired up during this um, quest, but also not in a way that I felt was fulfilling. So I, that's why I kind of like stopped and I was buddy reading this collection with my friends Shannon and Kristen. And when they finished it, it seemed like there really wasn't any payoff for me finishing those last four pages. Like I had gotten the gist. And so I felt pretty good about the DNF. We have three stories left. The next one is The Fast Enough Human. This one was one that really grew on me and reminded me a lot of the th survival atmosphere in The Marrow Thieves that I read last fall. We have this um, character who I think is incredibly powerful and so kind of gets ostracized from her communities and it's also post-apocalyptic landscape and so she's traveling from clan to clan trying to find her place her purpose there's a lot of trying to figure out what is the best relationship to have with the land at this time in the certain state of things and just so many of that messaging and just the tone and the na nature of survival reminded me of the dystopian that is the marrow thieves so I just thought that that was just such an easy comparison, especially since they're also both indigenous interpretations of these thought experiments. And then counting her petals, I'm just going to compare it to most of the short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, because this is a story about these two women that are in a relationship. One's a trans woman and one is cis. And it's during a time, well, it could be our time. Trans rights are being really horribly affected in this short story and to escape one of the partners uses both the magic that the other partner has uh, one of them i think it might be root magic it might be something else but she has access to this magic and we get kind of insight into her past and how she acquired the magic and things like that it's very i don't know folklore fairy tale adjacent and she uses um her partner uses computer programming and the, what she learns about the magic to try and make this perfect paradise to escape into but it's not quite perfect and it's not a place that they can stay it's just a very bittersweet story about relationships and it has that unsettling i don't know what's real quality that i remember from a lot of the relationship exploration in her body and other parties um especially i guess not just her body and other parties, but Carmen Maria Machado's um, memoir. Although this is not an abusive relationship, which is a lot of the relationships that are explored, but I was just, the way feminism was approached reminded me of those short stories. And then the last story is Fever Dreams. And I'll be honest, the first time I read the story, I did not like it. I was like, I don't know what I just read. <laughs> I don't know the purpose of it. Why is this the last story in this collection? What's going on, Nisi Shaw? And then Shannon and I were discussing it and I'm like, oh, this is really smart. So it's a very thematic ideas focused work about the role of stories and how much artists, especially artists of color, are meant to just help people learn and things like that. It's really interesting. Um, and so because of the metaphor of it, I was starting to be drawn to Strange Beasts of China that I read um, this past winter, where yes, it's about the stories on the surface level, but it's also about what do those stories mean? Why do we have this collection of stories? What is the message underneath that? Um, and I just like the layering of both of them a lot. Like the more I think about them, the, the better they become for me. So that briefly are a bunch of, you know, synopses of what you'll find in this short story anthology, a lot of works that and art that it reminded me of. I hope you give it a try. This is just really stellar, especially if you're just like looking for a place to explore um, short stories, especially unique short stories, short stories from voices you might not have heard from before. It's great. And Putao agrees if you can't hear him off camera. <laughs> this is definitely worth your time. He actually just came right up. So I'll show you guys if you made it to the end of the video, you'll get to see his lovely face. Let me know if you have any plans to read this anthology. If you have any other works you would recommend to me based off some of these that I said I really like. If you just Putao. My cat is being very loud. If you just want to leave an emoji, <laughs> since I obviously need to end this soon. Um, Leave a sun, obviously, because the new suns. I feel like that's like a basic one. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.